<laughs> what is going on my fellow gamers or two sorted witchers it is the blind prophet and today i wanted to bring a video talking about the witcher 3 wild hunt a game some of you might already be familiar with but a game I just came to really get to know recently after I was able to obtain the complete edition on Steam for $15, a game which has been taking up a large amount of my time. <laughs> so without further hesitation, let's get right into my experience and why I think you should play this gem in 2019. My experience. First off, I'd just like to talk about the overall acquaintance I've had with CD Projekt Red's latest large title. However, if you've already played through the game yourself, I'll have a timestamp in the description for you to skip to why you should play it again in 2019. But to be quite honest, I never really regarded The Witcher as a game I would want to play. I already have a hard time with the high fantasy genre of this sort, with magic and monsters, and have even played Dungeons and Dragons, but find the world so hard to grasp and follow, which is ironic given that I grew up with and loved The Lord of the Rings and even The Chronicles of Narnia. However, with both franchises, they sort of lead you into their worlds, where in The Lord of the Rings, you follow Frodo Baggins, who is thrust into a journey through Middle-earth and has to destroy a ring that is of great power and danger, and in The Chronicles of Narnia, you follow a group of siblings who come across a world unlike their own with mystical creatures and magic. You can relate with both instances because you learn and experience everything with the protagonist, and it's not all thrown around as common knowledge, which was the feeling I got playing Dungeons and Dragons or other high fantasy RPGs. However, The Witcher does this in both ways. Even with it having two predecessors with pre-established lore, with the encounters with monsters you acquire entries in a bestiary where you can see their weaknesses, as well as having certain dialogue options that help explain certain settings, events, people, or places more clearly, and I never fell out of the loop. I always knew what was going on, whether it be magic, monsters, or just the story, and I loved that. Side quests helped a lot with this too, where you could learn more about things in the game, and in general, the side quests are amazingly written and played out. I've never felt so morally conflicted in a game as I do when playing some of these side quests where you might have to make decisions that could lead to how others perceive you, how you perceive yourself, or even life itself hanging on your choices. And it just balances so well, leaving me to reflect and think almost as if I had made a real decision that could affect real people, because that is how well written some of these encounters are. I really don't want to spoil any, I feel you should experience every single one for yourself, but just know this isn't a game you want to ignore side quests or exclamation points on. But also, just a reminder, before we move further, this game came out in 2015 and it tops encounters I've had in games most recent like Red Dead Redemption, which I thought had the best to date. Speaking of Red Dead Redemption, move over Arthur Morgan, there's a witcher in town. The main protagonist Geralt of Rivia is one of the most captivating protagonists I've ever had the pleasure of playing as in a video game. And as previously mentioned, you do make a lot of choices, and my Geralt of Rivia could be different than your Butcher of Lavakin, just the same as we were able to shape Arthur Morgan's choices in Red Dead Redemption 2. But there's still a clear narrative through it all, and we see a lot in Geralt, through his replies, which could be witty, threatening, or sentimental, which I was surprised by because every time I saw promotional material or gameplay, I expected a sort of John Wick character out of Geralt. Now, before you start getting all your guns loaded and your knives sharpened, hear me out. I love the John Wick movies, and come my next paycheck, we'll be getting my tickets. However, Baba Yaga himself is an extremely boring character. He can fight like a goddamn madman and shoot better than Deadshot, but as far as a character, I don't get much satisfaction from him, and I don't think it's entirely intentional, as my boy Keanu whoa, Reeves was trained vigorously in gun drills and martial arts, and the focus wasn't really on his character, it was on his physical performance, and we got the character sort of told through other people in the story. That is what I thought would be the case with the White Wolf, but instead we are treated to a gruff voice with a soft heart, a sharp sword with a deep concern for those around him. I didn't expect to like him so much, but now I've come to be really invested in him and the stories as a whole, and have even taken the liberty of purchasing the first in the series of books which the games are based on to learn more and experience more. But let's talk about some of the weaker points I've come across because even though it's probably one of the best games I've ever played, it's not perfect. Looting can sometimes be a pain when there's a torch or multiple points of loot stacked on each other and it gets to be a real annoyance sometimes forcing me to jump around or reconfigure the camera and sometimes having to use the witcher sense for some reason especially underwater and what you're looting can be extremely underwhelming being that it's an rpg everything is level and stat based so something can lose its worth by the time you surpass its level or you could be under like 20 levels and are forced to either put it in stash carry it around or sell it also on the note of the rpg stats and such i really don't like that we have to change our appearance when finding 
giving you better gear. I really wish you could just upgrade your pre-existing gear using the gear you found bringing the stats up because Geralt's base gear looks really really cool. And the only other thing that I found to be a downside is saving. Now I grew up playing games where you constantly were saving your progress, but that's not the world we live in now with autosave in almost every game, and it can be a real hindrance to the experience when I've been exploring a little bit, then fall 20 feet and have to start over. But I mean at least it's not as bad as it used to be, as it does autosave at certain points, but it's still enough to give me Final Fantasy VII Vietnam flashbacks. Why you should play it in 2019. Okay, so with my quasi out of date review out of the way, why should you play The Witcher 3 in 2019? Cyberpunk 2077. That's why. The beautiful, amazingly talented artists at CD Projekt Red are currently undergoing production on their newest action-adventure RPG title, Cyberpunk 2077, a futuristic first-person open-world experience which at first glance has virtually nothing to do with the Witcher series that CDPR has built themselves on, but I'm here to tell you that you need to play at least The Witcher 3 before playing Cyberpunk 2077, and here's why. The story. The Witcher 3 doesn't have just a story of bringing your wife's ashes to a mountain with your tween age son or finding a lost treasure with your long lost brother that is consistent all the way throughout, but rather you are faced with many different interweaving and isolated stories and characters that all carry their own gravity on how you experience the game. As I mentioned before with the side quests, there is so much to engage that you sort of forget that you're looking for your adopted daughter, Siri at times. I see this being even on a larger scale on Cyberpunk 2077, as well as having a bigger focus on choices and approach. One thing that The Witcher doesn't have is a stealth element, which arguably it doesn't need, but is an element which limits your approach to a situation, and Cyberpunk 2077 can definitely improve on this. However, in the meantime, The Witcher 3 can definitely provide a taste for what we can expect on the writing and execution of the stories that will be present in 2077. Style Now when playing The Witcher 3, I noticed that the game had a particular style to it that felt all its own. You can tell the developers truly loved what they were working on, and it gives me the sort of same wholesome feeling when playing, say, a Rockstar game, that you know everyone put effort and pieces of themselves in the game. I particularly have a great appreciation and fondness for whoever has sprinkled Quentin Tarantino references all over the game, as every single time one would come up, I was overcome with giddy joy and immediately texted Big Easy, telling him about the ones I came across. Quentin Tarantino is my favorite film director of all time, and you can find references of characters or dialogue from his movies in the game, which which felt like watching Caroline by Amine. Like a Tarantino movie. So whoever you are that put those in, I hope you put even more QT in Cyberpunk 2077. The game is also very mature, with lots of nudity, intimate scenes between characters, awesome gore, and sometimes all of those at once, which is something we know for sure will sort of be getting in 2077. But I just really enjoy being able to not feel like I'm playing a game that has to refrain from exploring itself in all ways, and CD Projekt Red is a self-publishing company that intends to stay this way in order to protect freedoms like this. CDPR also has a beautiful way of exploring detail in the game as well. Even now as I play, I'm still learning things and finding things that keep the game feeling fresh, which is particularly amazing considering how large the world is and how long the story is, and this is an element I hope carries over in Cyberpunk 2077 with how already dense Night City looks. The world. When I first played The Witcher 3, I was taken aback as to how large the world is, which is very important because it's one map technically, but split into separate areas of large maps themselves. And this was crazy to me, as I'm used to the conventional one large map that progressively has just gotten larger as time has gone on in gaming. And this is a sort of old way of doing maps. However, the world is filled with different biomes, enemies, people, stories, and secrets that all have a way of giving you a feeling to want to explore. There's just so many places like caves, underwater, snowy mountains, swamps, abandoned structures, and enemies that always feel fun to fight, because for each one you have to sort of tweak your approach based on their strengths and weaknesses, and it's so satisfying when you decapitate or dismember or even cut an enemy clean in half.
Now, obviously, Night City won't have the same sort of approach with caves or different monsters you can fight, but I think it could still be equally as dense. See, rather than monsters you face, differing levels of augmented humans or even bots, as we saw in the demo, V had to sort of exploit a weakness on Royce. And as far as exploration, you could come across abandoned rooms and buildings or augment yourself to go underwater. Or if the rumors are true, I love rumors, possibly space. I'm sure the same feeling of exploration that you get while playing The Witcher will be present in Cyberpunk and maybe even improved on. It's a great plowing game. Now with all the reasons linked to Cyberpunk, I also feel you should play The Witcher just to play it or replay it because it's a great game. It's been particularly refreshing as I've come out of the whole battle royale phase and just really enjoy getting lost in the world without caring about how I lit someone up but they one shot me with a shotgun. I mean I think we've all felt the fatigue but whereas a game like Red Dead Redemption eventually ends and your options are to 100% the game or replay it all again, battle royale or multiplayer games in general don't end. Yeah, they're extremely repetitive, as any game is at times, but that repetition can also be addictive, as there's so many possibilities and equally outcomes to them. However, playing a game like this, playing The Witcher, is just such an engaging, wholesome experience that you can't help but enjoy. I mean, it even has Gameception with its card game Gwent, which you could probably spend hundreds of hours on alone. Forget the story, and everything else the game has to offer, just play Gwent. <laughs> The edition that I got also has two DLC expansions, which at the time of this recording I have not been able to play, but I've heard they alone feel like full games in themselves, which is extremely exciting to hear coming out of games like Ghost Recon that have DLC or rather updates, as it is more common now, with a mission and some cosmetics. So to hear I basically bought three games for almost a fraction of the cost of one, that's awesome. Which is why I'm definitely urging you to play it now, as you can probably find a sale on it as again, it's four years old, so the price has gone down exponentially and it's lost some of its relevance. However, I'm sure as Cyberpunk gets closer and we see more marketing and advertising, the Witcher series will have more sales as well. So play it as soon as you can, especially if you plan to play Cyberpunk 2077. I personally can't wait for the game. But with all that said, I'm curious to know if you'll be playing The Witcher in preparation for Cyberpunk 2077 like I am. Have you already played The Witcher and plan to revisit it? Have you read any of the books? I would really love to know and talk about it with you in the comments down below as I try to respond and talk to every single one of you. Also, don't forget to add to the Atlas list, a growing list of games by Atlas Ravenwood that we'd like to play or recommend. And as always, stay hydrated, let them pass in peace, and Excelsior. Oh, that's hot. That's hot.